Hi, and welcome to a new video. This video is an addition to last week's video. In last week's video, I showed a review of the Miyota 8215 movement, which is part of the 8200 family. And I did a full review on it and gave you all the specs and my opinion on the movement, especially in comparison to the Seiko NH or 4R series of movements. If you haven't seen the video, the link for the video is in the top line of the description and now in the top right corner of this video. And in this week's video, we will put this movement on a time grapher and see how well it performs, how accurate and precise it actually is. The movement we have on the time grapher today is a Miyota 8215. It's part of the 8200 family. The movement family was generally designed some 50 years ago. So as we figured out in the last video, there are some things to the movement who are not quite up to date. Nevertheless, it's a pretty inexpensive and very reliable movement that is widely used today in many, many brands, but mostly in citizen watches. The movement we have here is basically new. It's fresh out of the box. I haven't done anything to it. It has not been taken out of the watch or been used in a watch. I bought the movement off of eBay. It has a couple of hours of runtime on it, but that's that's pretty much it so far. And I haven't adjusted uh, it or done anything else to it to give you a comparative idea of a movement that is fairly new. For the test, the movement is fully wound and it's been working like that for about an hour or so, so that everything in the watch has stabilized and it is well worn in, so to speak. First of all, I want to give you some general information about the movement. The movement has a power reserve of 42 hours, a beat rate of 21,600 vibrations per hour, and uh, it is expected to run in between minus 20 and plus 40 seconds a day with a posture difference of not more than 50 seconds a day. The lift angle of the movement is 49 degrees and you have to dial that in on your time grapher. That's important. It has 21 joules. We talked about that in the last video. Watch that video if you want to know more about that. And yeah, let's get into it. What are my expectations for this movement? Since we talked about how it is designed and built and some of the shortcomings that the movement might have, I don't have great expectations. I don't have chronometer standard expectation for this movement. I would expect it to be comparable to the NH35 or the NH36 for that matter. I think that would be expectable. I don't necessarily think that it will be much more precise than those movements, but I have seen these movements generally perform way, way better than they are expected to run by the manufacturer, in this case Miyota, but uh, obviously what we are not testing is the real-life application. We are sort of doing a dry test on a time grapher. We are not testing for temperature stability. We are not testing for shock stability over a day. It will be interesting to see if different positions affect the rate of the watch in, in different ways, because I think these relatively inexpensive movements are generally regulated, but not regulated to different orientations for that matter, and therefore that's where I expect maybe some issues if there are issues, but we will see. As I already said, for this test the movement has been fully wound and it's working like that for about an hour. The date mechanism is not engaged. This is something that is very important because otherwise the date changing mechanism will drain a lot of energy from the main barrel and that energy will be missing in the gear train basically and that slows down the watch a little bit, but what it does mostly is that it costs amplitude and we would see that. And in fact, I had to record this video twice because when I was doing the video for the first time, I was confused as to why the amplitude was so low. And then I remembered that I hadn't checked if the date mechanism was engaged. So now we're on the second try and this time I've adjusted that. Let's get into the actual time grapher part of this video. We have the movement on the microphone and uh, we will start by setting up the machine in the correct way. Uh, what we have to do is to adjust the lift angle to 49 degrees and I also like to take down the test period to four seconds so that we get a data point every four seconds which uh, gives us uh, an idea about the variability. 
And uh, yeah, what we see is at the moment a rate of plus 8 seconds a day, an amplitude of 258 degrees uh, from the balance, a beat error of 0.3 seconds, and we see the adjusted lift angle in the corner and the vibration of 21,600 vibrations per hour. The vibrations of 21,600, that will never change, that's a fixed setting of the movement, and all the other three variables are subject to change, and uh, actually this is looking quite well. The beat error, let's start with that, uh, 0.3 milliseconds, totally fine in my book. Um, for a movement like that, where the beat error can be easily adjusted, this is totally fine, and I, I'm sure this will, this is a value that will change when we put the watch in a different position. A amplitude of around 260 is pretty okay. I would like to see a little bit more in, in this kind of position, but yeah, well, I'm, I'm impressed so far. Uh, let's change the position of the movement on the time grapher and see how the values change. What's different here is that now the pinions of the wheels and the balance rest in both joules. So we have twice the friction in the movement, but obviously we have the same power that is given into the watch by the main barrel. The amplitude drops from around 260, 240, and it's dropping even more. These values always need a little time to adjust, and if you introduce a sudden movement, it'll take a couple of seconds to rearrange itself. But what we see is that the beat error increased slightly to 0.4 milliseconds, which is still totally fine. In a movement like that, I would say a value up up to 0.8 would be acceptable. The rate of the watch slightly increased, but honestly that two or three seconds is not that much that much of a change. So let's move the movement on the time grapher even further and see if it changes even more. We now have the movement on a fully sideway position where all of the pinions are fully resting in both jewels and we really do have sort of twice the friction in the movement and uh, this is typically the position that should affect the rate of the watch the most, but honestly we don't really see any much more of a change here, which is actually kind of surprising. I, I like that. The amplitude didn't drop anymore, the beat error didn't increase anymore, the rate is still sort of in the same range, plus 10 seconds is really totally okay, and it's now even improving. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. I did not expect that. Let's change the position of the movement again, and uh, we are still in a sort of sideway position, but um, we now turned it basically completely around its axis. This sometimes also does things to the movement, which is kind of interesting. Uh, and, and in this case, the uh, amplitude really dropped even 10 degrees more, so we are now in the 220s, uh, which actually is, I think, kind of low. I, I would like to see a little bit more. If we would be like in the 250s, that would be that would be okay. But the rate actually is is improving quite well. We are now back to just plus four, plus three seconds, somewhere in between there, and everything else seems pretty stable. So we are still at the same beat error. That's actually pretty pretty impressive. So we are now going for one last position on the time grapher, and the interesting thing about this position is that this is typically the position that the watch is worn in, because now we are with the dial side up, and this is typically if you're if you're working on a desk and you're working on a computer or something like that, this is the position that the watch would typically be worn in. So this would be the position where you would expect the watch to be adjusted for. But we see what, what I almost expected. The uh, amplitude basically immediately recovers because we eliminated half of the friction in the movement. The beat error has also improved uh, and it's back to 0.2 milliseconds, which is really absolutely fine for a movement like this. And uh, the rate is back to around plus seven, plus eight seconds. And uh, we really never tipped into the negative numbers. Well, I'm really quite impressed, I must say. So I think because we have seen the fact, my conclusion can be relatively short. I'm actually quite impressed by this movement. Obviously it is brand new and it will never be as precise as it is now, basically. But for a movement that I didn't expect to be very well regulated and uh, given the spec sheet that it expects some 60 seconds of uh, deviation over a day, given the range of minus 22 to plus 40 seconds a day, I think uh, this result is 
rather impressive and um, well obviously if you have more experience with this movement in a real life application for example in a watch and you've been wearing it for a couple of months or a year tell us your experiences and write them down in a, in a comment down in the comment section and yeah for now I hope this was informative and entertaining for you to watch and uh, yeah I hope to see you in the next video thank you for watching this video I hope you enjoyed it like and subscribe if you don't want to miss out on new videos in the future. And you can also follow me on Instagram for more content. You find the link for Instagram in the video description. If you have any watchmaking related questions or if you have any ideas for future videos, feel free to comment them in the comment section down below. Thank you and I hope to see you in the next video again.